Freddy. Drop Dead Freddy. Oh my God. No, you stop that. <laughs> you don't watch Handmaiden's Tale because you don't have Hulu. So right. you know the movie Drop Dead Fred though, right? Yeah. Yeah, yeah, totally. So somebody just made like a, a poster, they superimposed or whatever it's called, the faces from characters from that show, Handmaiden's Tale, to the movie poster for Drop Dead <laughs> Fred, because there's a bad character on it that's Fred Waterfer, and he just got picked up by the police. <laughs> so, <laughs> so it was like really cool in the last episode because his wife finally, like, I'm assuming she did. I think everybody else is too. She finally turned his ass fucking in to the authorities or whatever. And I know you don't know the story, so we're not going to talk about it, but it was funny that you just said Drop Dead Fred, and I swear <laughs> this morning I'm looking at a poster of Drop Dead Fred, but with like their faces on it. Now, okay, that's really random because that movie is definitely from the 90s. It's not one that anybody ever talks about anymore. I don't watch that show. I don't follow anything that has You would to have do never it. seen it. And here you are just throwing it out. And I'm like, Lit. funny that you mention it. <laughs> <laughs> we are on the same playing field, I, I promise. It's, it's we're like, like linked. Get outside of my head. <laughs> when, when we were vacationing together twice, wasn't it that we we were saying the same fucking things basically? <laughs> yes. Oh my god. Yeah. It's it's getting to the point now where it's like I don't know. It's it's creepy. Like how when you pointed out that guy's name on the last podcast, and you're like, well, "How do you say this?" I'm like, "Holy shit! That's the demon that I just saw. That's really, you know, loves Gemini's." And I'm like, "Oh my god!" And you're like. Uh, okay, so I'm not that hip to demon names. I'm like, I'm not either, but I know that one. Because you had it just was- seen it. And it's just like you you sent me a story about a TB patient and I'm reading about TB. <laughs> like, it's yeah. like so fucking weird. Stop it. <laughs> well, see, that's why I get so scared that we're going to be end up doing the same story one of these times. Right? <laughs> No. There's times that we've, we've picked stories and there are similarities to those stories. Oh, yeah, we're on what the same. What if you're about to do the story that I have right here? <laughs> I know, that's what I'm saying. Like, I hope not. <laughs> okay, so maybe we should just kind of get to it. So this is a podcast, just in case you didn't realize it. I mean, you opened your podcast app and you you push play and everything. So you had to know it was a podcast. But... That's right. We were like, let's check out this one. It's paranormal. It looks cool. They might know what they're talking about. Let's check it out. <laughs> we totally do know what we're talking about. <laughs> That's right. We're talking about paranormal stuff and cryptids and how we both have the same inner sixth sense somehow, some way, even though Wendy, who is not me, I'm Chris, and Wendy is in Arizona That's and me. I'm in yeah. England, <laughs> you know. <laughs> We're like two opposite ends of the U.S. here, and we're like still connected. It's crazy. But yeah, we're the Creatures of the Night. That's the name of our little podcast here, and it's the name of our group that we've had for like 10 years now, and maybe that's why we're our group, uh, our group of us two, <laughs> our pairing. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> that's what we call our pairing, and maybe that's why we're so connected, just a long time of being together. We have shared a lot of paranormal experiences together, too. We've been to some amazingly creepy, haunted places. And and some of those places, too, that we just went on tours of. And by the end, we're kind of like, there's nothing happening here. But by the time it's just us two together in these creepy places, then that weird shit starts happening. And we experience something crazy. We run out of there talking about it for (laughs) days, weeks, months still to this day, you know, <laughs> yeah. and then we start oh. podcasts so we can tell everybody else again. <laughs> you still have to know about these can't things. get over it. No, <laughs> no, that's so true. Well, that plus the people that we tried to tell that were there just wouldn't listen to us. So now we have to tell the world. <laughs> there is that. You're not doing that story, are you? No, I'm not. Okay. That would be so funny. <laughs> A great lead in, <laughs> by the way. <laughs> That's one that we've talked about before here and there, and we're just not quite sure how to handle it without coming across like complete assholes. Because yeah. we kind of dealt with assholes during it. So that that's a tour that we did for a location that one day we'll talk about. We just don't know if we want to tell you the raw truth of it yeah. or if we want to sugarcoat it to be polite. <laughs> You know. Yeah, right. Yeah, right. So well, I think we'll probably do the polite way of, of yeah. explaining things. And then like 14 episodes later, we'll be like, Those remember that place? Suck ass. 
<laughs> you know, there was a lot of cool stuff that came out of that location, like yeah. evidence that we collected and experiences we had. So it was not disappointing. It, no. It's just disappointing when you're around people that don't don't want to associate with you, really. <laughs> so really? Like, really, really don't want to associate with you. We think we're nice people. It's like oh okay i don't know if it's because we were there with this larger you know uh they were supposed to be known uh, to some degree i didn't i don't know who they were other than the fact that they had a book i don't know if it was because we were with them and they were kind of like the stars of the show so when we kind of were like we got this evidence that was not with them it was on our own that they were just kind of like you know, yeah, well, we don't either believe you or we don't care because you're not those other people. You know, maybe was- they were just tired. Maybe they were just <laughs> fucking over it by the end of the day. I mean, haven't you been that tired before that it's like, no matter what anybody's telling okay. you, you're I like, guess- yeah, I I can't care right now. I'm so <laughs> sorry. <laughs> In my own home, 100 percent. Right. Yes, in my own home, when something is going on, I'm like, ghost, piss off. I (laughs) I have to go to work tomorrow. I know you're talking to me, but come the fuck on. So they could have been like that. They're just like, no, not tonight. Go to bed. Well, when we were in uh, New Orleans, when we first started this whole podcast thing, there was a night where, I mean, we had just been going all day and it's hot and it's sweaty there and stuff like that. And then it was like, what three o'clock in the fucking morning and we're <laughs> yeah. still trying to talk to these ghosts wow. we're still trying to do it be involved we were using a pendulum Oops. but yeah. but it was acting bizarre and it seemed like it was really responding to us and it was working and we're like oh my god tell us more and you're like wendy i'm about to fucking fall asleep <laughs> <laughs> i couldn't keep my eyes open it was such a good paranormal investigation that we had going on and we were sitting on the stairs and I did one of those my eyes shut yeah. and I was like oh my god I'm gonna be a ghost in this house pretty soon <laughs> I'm, I'm about, about to-, to fall down the fucking <laughs> stairs yeah that's when you're just like uh I'm sorry ghost <laughs> I have to go to bed if it just wasn't so hot here in New Orleans or uh, St. Francisville where we were, then maybe I would have been able to deal with it a little bit more. But we were super excited. We put a lot of energy into our day from going from uh, place to place and exploring because that's that's just what we do. We've said that on previous podcasts. We just we get up, we get ready, and we go a thousand percent as soon as we're up we're just like let's go here let's go there that's haunted this is haunted somebody died here somebody's buried here we got to see it all you know there's a bunny there might be a crocodile i mean it's just like go 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 it's all exciting i mean we're like little puppies all day long and you know like they love to sleep i mean so that's us and we just i can't do all that caffeine i do a lot of caffeine like yeah. coffee and tea, give that to me all day long. But remember when we used to like Red Bull it to yes. get through the night? Yes. No, stomachs are not handling that shit anymore. Oh, it's not worth yeah. it. <laughs> I think I could pull an all-nighter if I was super prepared for it. But yeah. don't put me in a cushy B&B with a fluffy bed and nice covers oh. and air condition. <laughs> it's like... I can't uh, have I can't have the amenities, but if you put me like and we talked in the last one about Waverly, if no. you put me in like some rugged ass shit like that, I'd be like, yep. Yep, there is nowhere to put my head. So, <laughs> yeah, no, definitely. That's not a place where we could sleep. Also, you know, when we're in a place where we know we are sleeping there, right. we're, we're not you know, going to be pushing ourselves to the limit when we go to places like we had in the past where we would drive to that location, stay up through the night and then drive home. We had no other choice but to slam as much caffeine or sugary drinks or whatever else we could crash our stomachs with that would also keep us alive for the evening. But it's a little different now because we're so far away. And when we do go to these places, we are going to end up sleeping there or out in the vehicle, (laughs) you know, (laughs) depends on which is cozier at the moment. (laughs) <laughs> right. Car camping, not against that when demons are involved. So, you know, right. <laughs> you can't trust those fuckers. They might gr- draw mustaches on your face and stuff while you're sleeping. <laughs> <laughs> that honestly would be the bomb. Um, it's the rest of the Nobody stuff would do. believe us. I mean, they would just be like, they did that to them, each other. I mean, that will- 
now that you announced it, and I was going to say next time we're totally doing that, but I guess I can't, we can't because now I announced it. <laughs> no, I, and I would not do that shit to you. <laughs> Instagram stories. <laughs> Who did that to your face? It wasn't me, Chris. Oh my God. <laughs> no. <laughs> oh, so check this out. This week, ugh, that's all I have to say about it. It was a bad week for me. <laughs> Here I was, hating work, like I do most every day. I'm driving home and decompressing as best as I can in my <laughs> alleged rush hour traffic, which is like nothing. Uh, <laughs> my 15-minute commute is 30 minutes on the way home now that they fixed the bridge. So it's, it's, it's decent. But I don't really have enough time between work and home to, you know, remove all of the negativity from work or whatever. So I try to do as much detoxing in the car as I can, which means now I no longer listen to books on audio or podcasts on the way home because I, I just don't listen to them. I'm still actually having those conversations in my head, well, really arguments of all the things that I should have said out loud while I was at work, but you know, <laughs> that will never happen because I can't blatantly get myself fired. Um, or arrested. So, or arrested. <laughs> <laughs> so I just listen to music on the way home. But anyways, I finally get home and I started researching my next story to share with the world on our podcast. And staring me in my face was this story about this girl in Germany that apparently had all types of crazy shit going on around her. But this only happened to her while she was at the office. So I was like, tell me more, internet. <laughs> <laughs> this sounds so cool. This is so crazy. So I'm scrolling down and I'm reading and I find out that this was apparently known as the Rosenheim Poltergeist of 1967. And it appears to have been one of the most highly documented incidents of poltergeist activity on record. I have to assume highly, most highly documented incidents of poltergeist activity on record uh, that that was in Germany. I, I don't know. It, it's just everything that I read said those exact words. Like they were so sure that this was the most highly documented poltergeist case. So anyways, all of the people involved in the Rosenheim case all noted large amounts of strange phenomenon. I watched a documentary on YouTube, which was kind of funny. Actually, the first one I watched was all in German, and I was like, that's okay. I'll just muster my way through it. No, no, no. <laughs> I found one that had subtitles, and then I just read it. <laughs> they had to get a phone company out there because there was a number that was called so many times in a row that it was deemed inhumanly possible. And it was like the number to call when you want to get the exact time. Now, remember, this is the 60s, so they didn't have cell phones. They could just be like, yep, it's still not time to go. Yep. You know, <laughs> so it's calling that number over and over again. They had the line disconnected, but the number was still being dialed. Oddly enough, they determined that nothing would happen in the office when she, her name is Anne-Marie Schabert, whenever she wasn't actually around. So Anne-Marie was apparently going through some turmoil in her life at this time. She, uh, her engagement had sadly been broken off and she hated where she worked. <laughs> Go figure. Can relate. No. Can relate. <laughs> I was just like, like I said, I just got home after a bad day and I'm like, what am I going to, and this story was right there. So she'd come to work and shit would start going bonkers. Shit goes bonkers for me too, but that's just because people want to be dumb where I work. You know, now check this out. Heavy hanging lights would start to swing. What? The actual, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and like, so it's, it's an office too in the 60s in Germany. So they had like chandeliers basically in these offices. So that's what I mean by heavy hanging lights. The actual light bulbs would burst one at a time. No. Yeah, one even shattered so fiercely that it smashed a hole in one office wall. Boom! And that was another one of the YouTube videos. Like, the, the guy is speaking in German. He's kind of laughing, but he's pointing out the hole that it had made. He's like, look, you think I'm crazy? It's right here, guys. This is it. How the fuck is he <laughs> laughing about that? Is he laughing because he's like, I don't work in this fucking place no more? <laughs> <laughs> Probably. Probably. I, I don't know exactly what he was saying. You know, Like I said, it was transcribed, and it was just like... The light bulb burst, and this is the hole. Of course, the guy's like, oh, 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 you know, and he's saying some shit. Yeah. So they're probably like, yeah, we're just going to say that this is what he's saying. 
No, I'm sure it was. I mean, like, what are you going to do? You know, it sounds crazy what you're telling yes. people. But yeah. you're like, I swear to you, this is what I saw. Well, and that's probably what he was saying, too. This is going to sound fucking bonkers, guys. But <laughs> <laughs> this is what happened. So Anne-Marie worked for a pair of lawyers. And one of them, for some weird reason, admitted that he was standing watching Anne-Marie make copies. Like a great big old creeper. <laughs> <laughs> And I'm starting to see why she didn't like being there so much. You know, guys just sitting there staring at her. But suddenly... Worse that he admits it to you as if it's like a compliment. He's like, I I watch you do copies. It's like, (laughs) okay, Fred. (laughs) Right. Okay, Fred. Now, it'd be different if he actually explained something like, she was teaching me how to use the copier because I don't generally do that shit. Oh, okay. Got it. Or I was making sure you weren't wasting paper or something. Right. You know, that there's some reason other than I'm just really into that. (laughs) (laughs) I mean, and it could be that there's just so much like phenomenon going on around that he's just watching to make sure that she doesn't like trip the copier machine because that's an expensive (laughs) thing. Oh, yeah. Like maybe he was suspect of her that she's causing all this stuff. So he's keeping an eye on her. Keeping an eye on her. So uh, suddenly a picture on the wall spun slowly in a counterclockwise motion. That's the sign of the devil, right? That's bad stuff, (laughs) right? Never good. That's not a good thing. So how about this shit? She ends up leaving the law firm. Actually, what I've read, basically she was forced out because of all the weird phenomenon that was going on around her. But nothing else was ever reported to have happened there. However, the weird, unexplainable phenomenon followed her until she got married. Two additional jobs she had also reported crazy, unexplained things going on. But then it all just stopped. At this point in her life, either she's got everybody by the balls and they're like, nope, yep, all's good here, guys. Or seriously, nothing else is going on. That's pretty weird, right? It's very weird. You know, in our Wasika Wonder House, uh-huh. that girl... Was that Lorancy? Yeah. After she got married, she said all her shit stopped. All her shit stopped, too. That's and right. so it's like, does your husband tell you, man, you got to cut that shit out? And then right. he maybe starts helping you cover it up when it when you have slip ups, kind of like bewitched, you know? Oh. <laughs> <laughs> no, no, no. Like I said, all's no, no, good no. here, guys. Yeah, Everything's yeah, yeah, fine. yeah, yeah. It's good. Now he's now they've got somebody helping them like cover up and go along with the line and, and be like, no, 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 you didn't see anything. That's fine. Right. Or is it something like in her makeup, mature, you know, she matures or she becomes busy or something like that, that it's like dissipated and gone. Stop bothering yep. her. Um, I like where you're going with that thought. So um, hang on to that for a minute. I will. I have more for you. I can't wait. <laughs> <laughs> because if you thought Anne Marie's story was strange, wait till you hear about this next one. This one's from Ohio. This story is somewhat similar, but oh. <laughs> It's got some drama, too. This is the story of Tina Resch, the telekinetic mom, a.k.a. Tina was born on October 26, 1969, in Columbus, Ohio. Ten months later, her mother brought her to the hospital and then disappeared. That same day, Tina was placed in the home of Joan and John Resch, longtime foster parents who cared for over 250 children. Wow. Yes. That's a lot of children to pass through the doors of their home. That's crazy. Yeah. I mean, and I'm sure it's not all at one time, but still. (laughs) You think they remember all of their names? That's That's what I'm saying. I wouldn't. No. They're all the same. You would slowly start to forget about them. (laughs) Yeah. The Timmy's and Jessica's. That's all we've ever had. (laughs) (laughs) Although the Reshes had five kids of their own. They adopted Tina. Yeah. So they just loved him some kids. Yeah. It shows. Yeah. (laughs) She was said to be a happy child with a bubbly personality. But by the time she turned eight, she was diagnosed as hyperactive and placed on medication. Teachers told her parents that she was throwing erasers, pencils, and causing a scene. Interestingly, the teachers never actually saw her throwing any of the items, but they were certain that she was behind it. Tina claimed that her teachers made a big deal about taking her out of the room and her being on medicine, basically like these teachers were talking shit about her. So the other students started making fun of her and would bully her. The cruelty at the school only got worse. 
Her parents finally took her out of school when the other students had actually tied her up and taunted her mercilessly on the playground. What the fuck? I just can't believe that it would get to that level before anybody was like involved, you know? Yeah, yeah, you would think the principals would actually have a hand in contacting the the parents or, you know, something else would have been going on for, you know. Nobody heard her as she's being tied, I mean, right. like, drug away and tied up. Teachers. Like, yeah. So I'm assuming that maybe those teachers let the kids out on the playground. They went and had their smoke break. They just weren't right. paying any attention, you know. <laughs> so uh, she began doing her schoolwork at home with a private tutor and initially things went well. Tina thrived at home and enjoyed helping to take care of the other foster children. However, she was under a great deal of stress being at home. She spent almost her entire time at home and rarely left the house. After a deeper look into the rushes, Joan and John had actually been very strict foster parents. Tina had a compulsion to express herself by talking loudly. When told to be quiet, she remained loud and spouted obscenities. <laughs> and I don't know if I said that right. Obscenities? Obscenities. Obscenities. Thank you. Before she was too big for Joan to deal with, Joan would often slap her across her face. Mm. Later on, Joan would beat her for her behavior. Fuck no. And they oh, yeah. fostered 200 kids. 200 kids. Thank you. What the? Yeah. So we see what was going on there. Yeah. Because you get paychecks for that shit. So they didn't really like the kids so much as they liked the paychecks. And Tina's behavior only further escalated when at home full time. Her privileges were taken away as punishment, but when that didn't get the result Joan or John wanted, she was locked in her room or she was beaten. When Tina was given a psychological evaluation, it was discovered that she had a tendency to disassociate and also had poor depth perception. She felt extreme tension in her relationships and had an overwhelming need to express herself. But like I said, when she did, she was punished severely. Her life had been full of other tragedies. When she was 13, her best friend was killed in a car accident. Mm. Her brother, Jack, molested her. Oh. Yeah. And so March 1st happened, and when John attempted to beat her again, this is when it is believed that the activity started. That Saturday morning, Joan was washing dishes when she noticed her analog clock spinning out of control. The lights in the kitchen began turning on and off by themselves. At first, she assumed that Tina was pulling a prank. Then the TV and microwave turned on by themselves. After that, the garbage disposal started up on its own. Personally, I wish I had a garbage disposal. Anyone will (laughs) Give me a haunted garbage disposal any day. <laughs> I don't know about that. Aren't you like terrified? You're just like, oh, I dropped the fork down there. Let me check it out. And then whatever it turns on. <laughs> well, okay. In that case, this one being the kind of garbage disposal that it is turning on and off by itself. And maybe that's not a good thing. Man, that was like always the thing in the horror movies too from that time. Do you remember? Like yes. she just dropped a ring and she's got to get it. So she's got to go. I mean, if you don't, you can never use the garbage disposal again because every right. time you use it, you're going to hear that noise. And then you'll eventually just bring it or burn it out. So you're like, I got to get that. Yeah. I can't even remember the last time I lived in a house that had a garbage disposal. Maybe that's a good thing for me. <laughs> <laughs> uh, being that I'm the klutziest person that ever walked Earth. Um, anyways, Tina attempted to turn the TV off. Though the picture and sound remain, when she unplugged it, it continued to work. (laughs) It's like a lot of TV shit, man. I I don't know. Maybe it was a Zenith. I mean, I had that problem, too, back in the 80s. You know, it's just, you know, it stayed on. But her unplugging it, that should have done the trick. Yes. (laughs) No? (laughs) So I'd be immediately like, there's ghosts in here. We're moving. Right. We've got to go. Get that fucking TV out of the house. (laughs) Right. (laughs) In the laundry room, the washing machine started spinning quickly on its own. Again, I'm not really seeing a problem with this. I mean, I need help with the chores, and I don't think I'd be bitching. <laughs> now they even make laundry machines. That, that's like a special feature where it's like just, it just keeps going. You know, maybe the Rush's laundry machine was just a little bit more advanced. <laughs> I don't know. But Joan didn't really think so. She felt reasonably sure that they were having power surges, which was affecting all the appliances in the home. And I think that that's probably a very good logical explanation when all of your electronics are fucked up. I mean, except for the TV. Because when you unplug it, 
It's away from the power. Yeah, but. I was about to say, except for when it's not connected to power. <laughs> right. And it's still going. Yeah, that's <laughs> demons. So <laughs> when John returned from running errands, things were still fucking going bananas in the Rush household. Joan told him about everything turning on by itself. So he had decided to call electrician Bruce Claggett. Bruce heard a loud howling sound through the phone and could barely hear what John was saying. When Bruce arrived, he went to the main breaker box, took the cover off the fuse box, inspected the breakers, and made sure that there weren't any hot spots or loose joints. But he couldn't find an explanation for what was occurring in the home. As soon as Bruce walked outside, the activity began to start up. A light and its switch apparently turned on by itself. Bruce, now under the impression that Tina was pulling a prank on him, he decided to test his expert electrician theory by putting tape on all of the light switches in the living room. <laughs> He's going to show oh them. <laughs> so that, <laughs> I taped them all down. Good luck with that. He and John then went back to the switch by the front door. However, the hall lamp turned on by itself and the tape holding the switch down was gone. <laughs> Bruce was unable to explain what had happened, and he pieced the fuck out. <laughs> <laughs> I think he was like, yeah, it's demons. We, I just, sorry. Yeah, That's yeah. All. Call a priest next. <laughs> right. Later that day, more unexplainable occurrences affected the rush home. As John fed one of the infants in her high chair, the chair began to move on its own. At the same time, Tina was pushed out of her chair and thrown onto the floor. Seconds after that, a glass was thrown across the room. Within a few hours, the room was full of broken glass. Coasters and other objects were also scattered on the floor. Uh, with no end in sight, Tina decided to go for a walk. <laughs> Suddenly, I, mean, I just think it's so funny that I like this. I mean, I like that she's like, I've got to get out of here for a few minutes. You Duh, know? Everybody should have been like that. Everybody should break. be like, this shit is fucking crazy. <laughs> exactly. Let's go somewhere else now. Suddenly, Everything inside the home stopped and seemingly returned to normal. Joan starts to get suspicious now and thinking about everything that had happened also starts to wonder if other things that Tina had been blamed for during her childhood were actually due to Tina somehow, like the erasers and pencils being thrown in the classroom. That night when she returned home, it became clear to her that she was at the center of whatever was plaguing her home. The next morning, the same activity continued. More glasses were thrown from the counters. Eggs sitting in the carton were thrown onto the ceiling. Fuck those eggs. <laughs> <laughs> when Tina decided to put the remaining eggs back in the fridge, one somehow passed through the door and splattered against a nearby no. wall. <laughs> <laughs> what Ghost do egg. you mean? That's, that's <laughs> fucked up. That is fucked up. At this point, the Rushes suspected that a demonic entity was causing the problems in their home. I'm like, yes, how incredibly astute of you. <laughs> <laughs> so as you suggested earlier, they called in, I guess, a priest. I don't know. It says minister. Is that the same thing? Mm, I think that's more, I, I mean, it maybe it's just the terminology of whoever wrote it, you yeah. know, associates them as being the same thing. Catholic priests are technically the only ones that could yeah, do right. exorcisms, and they yeah. are priests, not ministers. So, <laughs> I mean, I don't well, know that's... a whole lot about details of each religion and all that stuff, but I think you'd say minister in things like Methodist or Baptist mm -hmm. or something, maybe Baptist, I don't know. You definitely say it, like, in, I know for Methodist, for sure. But I don't think you use it for Catholic priests. Okay. Thank you for that explanation. I think that helps to clear some things up. So their minister attempted to cleanse their the house. person. <laughs> <laughs> they're Methodist or something right. like that. And they're like, uh, we'll just get him down here. Yeah, he's, he's a guy. He's got the collar. He'll just, you know, see what he can do. Their yeah, minister. All work for the Lord. <laughs> right, exactly. So it's got to be the same thing. Tina was also now convinced that something evil was possessing her. When the rushes and their minister went into the living room, a couch lurched forward, hitting the minister in his leg. The minister told them that there was nothing else that he could do, and much like the electrician, peace the fuck out. <laughs> Again, <laughs> call a priest. I thought we did right. that. No, I said a priest. A priest. <laughs> We're Guys, different. Watch TV. 
you I know you have a TV because it wouldn't it was probably showing you at that moment that you should be calling a Catholic priest and they're like unplug it it's it's talking about demons I don't know it's something that was probably educational for you guys anyways Tina's physical condition worsened. However, doctors could find nothing wrong with her. Desperate for help, Joan called reporter Mike Harden. Still not calling that priest, though, I guess. (laughs) Right. They called a reporter. He brought along photographer Fred Shannon. And when they arrived, they all sat down in the cozy demon-infested living room for a good old (laughs) heart-to-heart. Suddenly, (laughs) yeah, (laughs) let's sit down here and have a chat. Suddenly, an afghan that was laying on the floor lifted up and covered Tina over her head. At this time, Fred brought his camera to his face and kept his finger on the trigger, hoping to take a photograph of the poltergeist activity. Welcome to the party, Fred. (laughs) Where was he two minutes ago? (laughs) This guy. I mean, I just would like to know when he was getting dragged into the situation, did they not give him any information about what's going on? They're just like, come on, photographer, you got to take some pictures. So he's just like, okay, well, I'll just wait here until I'm supposed to take the picture. And he's like, oh, shit, that was the moment. That was it. I was supposed (laughs) to take that picture. (laughs) Uh, And after about 20 minutes of Fred sitting there with the camera, his arms got tired. I'm sorry. Your job is taking pictures, right? Where is your fucking tripod? (laughs) He would never make it with like National Geographic for sure. No, right? Waiting for those animals to come out of their little little muskrats, waiting for them to come out, you know? (laughs) Come on. And how heavy was this camera that after 20 minutes, you're like, I can't hold it up any longer. Uh, As someone who stayed up countless evenings investigating the paranormal, Only to then get in a car and drive for hours. This whole my arms got tired part of the story bugs me just a little bit. But (laughs) I'm not going to get hung up there because there's plenty more that I get unraveled about, I promise. Anyways, Fred's little baby arms got tired and he set the camera (laughs) down on his lap. (laughs) Suddenly, the phone next to Tina was thrown across her and landed on the floor next to her. But somehow, Fred mustered up the strength to do his job and quickly photographed the phone receiver as it flew across her. It appeared that whatever entity was in the home was attempting to not have its picture taken. Mike noted that he did not see Tina throw the phone or do anything that would cause this to happen. The photograph became instantly famous, and Tina quickly became a media sensation. I will send you said photograph. I was hoping you were going to say you have this. I do have. Oh, yeah, I have it. Look at her face. I know, right? She, but here's the thing. Like, look at this. Look at this phone. There's another phone next to her. There's, like, shit everywhere. And this phone came flying out of nowhere because it looks like it was down on the fucking floor. There looks like there's, like, a fucking pill bottle on the floor on yeah. behind it. Is that a baby bottle just mm-hmm. empty on the, what you call it, like, end table or something? Yeah. I'd yeah. say it's really junky, but it just kind of is newspapers. And you can see the afghan that's laying in front of the door, too. But she also has one on the back of the chair, too. I mean, yeah. they are afghaned out. Like- they are, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> no one's getting cold in this household. <laughs> it's, a, it's an interesting photo. Mm-hmm. It is an interesting photo. I, where is the receiver to the phone? I don't know. No, I'm so sorry. What you talk into is the receiver. The receiver. What's, yeah, where's the base? Where's the base of the phone? I don't know, but there's also another phone right next to her. Like, how many phones in Afghans was, <laughs> like, happening at this house? I don't get it. And newspapers? I mean, they just had... Uh, this looks like a fire hazard to me. <laughs> I just... I don't know how it would have been faked. Right. Other than she physically tosses the phone and, and gets herself in position to make the face for the photo. Right. And with I cameras mean, of of this day, I don't know you could pull that off. Right. I mean, it's it's weird to me. Like, her reaction is perfect. She's like, whoa, like, what the hell is happening? Like, she's reacting to something flying in front of her. She doesn't know what it is. You know, it probably took her a second to come back from, you know, to reality after this happened to her, too. That's quite strange. Yes. Yeah, that's a strange one. So uh, the photograph became instantly famous. And because of that, Tina became a media sensation. 
Several reporters descended on the home. Many of them were quite skeptical. One of the reporters and his crew actually caught her in the middle of hoaxing an episode. Oh. Tina claimed that the reporters told her mom, her mother, excuse me, that they would not leave unless they saw something. She then decided that she would knock over a lamp and blame it on the poltergeist. <laughs> <laughs> She's like, get the fuck out. There it is. <laughs> When she explained her reasoning, many still believed her, but there were also many people that had seen things going on, too, that they couldn't actually explain. So they had a reason to feel like, OK, I can see you basically doing this to get rid of them. I mean, sure, it makes sense. They're invading your privacy right now. I could totally see that. You're you're annoyed. So you're like, yeah. here, are you satisfied? Leave me the fuck right. alone. Go away. Exactly. Mike called in noted parapsychologist Dr. William Roll to investigate Tina and her apparent psychokinesis, which involves moving objects with one's own mind. Dr. Roll claimed that for the first three days he was there, nothing happened. Then on the fourth day, he and Tina were in her room when a mug was thrown across it, and he said she was way too far away where she couldn't have even come in contact with the mug. Now he believed that something really was going on at this house too. I just think it's funny that it was like on the fourth day when the demon's like, fuck, I've got to act out. It's time. <laughs> <laughs> During another incident, Dr. Roll heard a crashing sound behind him in the master bedroom. They went into the room and found a painting laying on the floor. As they tried to put it back up, his tape recorder was thrown across the room. Then a pair of pliers they were using was also thrown across the room. Hold up. Why are there fucking pliers in the bedroom? <laughs> they were using the pliers, I guess, to hang the, rehang the picture. So I don't know if they were pulling out the plugs or whatever. I don't, I don't know what they were doing. But it said that they were actually using the pliers to hang the picture back up on the wall. Okay. I just think it's funny. I would like to know if the pliers were still in their hand and it went zoop. Yeah. Because it doesn't say. It was like a pair of pliers that they were using, and and it was thrown across the room. Had they set it down for a second, went back, then I guess that's what happened. But I would well, like it better. I could see, I don't know, they have to pull like a nail or something, whatever, out of the wall with the pliers, and then now yeah. they're ready to rehang the picture, and they set the pliers down, and then there you go. Swoop, they're off the whatever. That's yeah. fucked up. Like, yeah. I mean, that there's lots of somebody. things that are being thrown around this yeah. place that are pretty dangerous, but like glass, yeah, flyers, yeah, uh, and there's infants around too, so maybe not uh, the best scenario. I mean, throw pillows. That would be fun. <laughs> <laughs> Everybody loves a pillow fight. <laughs> sure, <laughs> demon pillow fight. <laughs> Doctor Roll was convinced that the home needed to be investigated further, and he also believed that Tina needed some help and counseling. She ended up going with him to North Carolina. Dr. Roll felt that Tina was unusually susceptible to electrical energy. He believed that the occurrences in the Rush home represented Tina's inner turmoil. And Joan even believed that the energy in Tina kept building up until finally it just exploded. When she returned home from Durham, Tina felt unloved by the Rushes and that they had rejected her as her biological parents had done. They also blamed her for all the things that had gone wrong. The Rushes would further blame Tina for her neighbor's reactions towards them that had apparently all changed because of the activity. I'm sorry, but your neighbors were some nosy assholes. And they're the ones the Rushes should have been angry with here, not your foster kid that needs more help. What the hell? Listen. I mean, we can go back to the very beginning of the story where she was getting bullied and abused yeah. at school, at home, mm -hmm. sexually abused. They failed her yeah, as fucking did. parents. They failed her just as, you know, protecting another human being. Yeah. And then they have the balls to sit there and be like, you made things break in our house. Mm -hmm. You're the worst. Yeah. The neighbors thought we were weird. <laughs> oh, they didn't think you were weird that you abused your children and allowed them to be sexually abused? That nope. that wasn't a problem? No. Nope. That was okay? There are some real strange folks here. Like, yeah, they, they're basically taking all of this, turning it around on her, even though they, they I feel like they cause a lot of this to happen. If they weren't such assholes to begin with, maybe Tina would have been a lot cooler you know, maybe instead of throwing glasses at them, she would have been actually like washing dishes, you know? Yeah. I 
she was trying at first to yeah. be helpful, turning the washer machine on and right. stuff like that. <laughs> And yeah, it's like, right. Nobody appreciates what I do around here with my powers. <laughs> right. Oh, well, I'm going to start breaking shit. And throwing those pliers at you. <laughs> so these rushes, they were totally upset by the disruption of their family life. And in 1986, they decided to sell their house and they told Tana to get lost. And she's how old at this point? We don't know for uh, sure. In 86. So she was born in 69, I think. Let me go back. Let me go she's back. She's an adult. Yeah. She's, yeah. Yes. Yeah. She yes. is. She's not like 16 and they're like, no. get the fuck out. No. Uh, Tina's truancy made where she lived a court decision. And she had two choices either go to juvie or live with James Bennett, which Bennett told the court he and Tina had eloped. She, of course, supported this falsehood, although they did eventually get married. So she was old enough, like you suggested, she was an adult where some guy comes in and he's like, we eloped, we're married, whatever. And they're like, okay, fine. She can make her own decisions. (laughs) Sadly, things only got much worse for Tina. Bennett was physically violent with Tina and Tina was forced to move into a woman's shelter. John Resch ended up passing away in 1987. His mother ultimately died shortly after him, leaving Tina with $5,000. But guess what? Cool-ass James Bennett fucking stole it. (laughs) So Tina divorces him. Yeah. He seemed like a cool dude. I don't exactly have the same timeline as I did with Anne-Marie Schabert, but at some point, the activity surrounding Tina was said to have stopped. So before I go any further, I need to issue a disclaimer. Tina's story gets worse and worse from this point on. I'm just putting that out there. It it gets pretty bad. So Great. Tell me more. In 1988, Tina became pregnant by a man whose name she did not reveal. Her daughter, Amber, was born in September. And for the baby's sake, Tina married uh, Larry Boyer, which Tina, now going by Christina, ended up having him arrested after he beat her into unconsciousness. She contacted Roll about this time, and he suggested she stay with his wife and him. When she lived with the Rolls, Tina was learning parenting skills and taking nursing and computer classes. The next year, she met David Heron, a divorced father of a three-year-old daughter. Things appeared to be going well for Tina, and I really wish that I could tell you that everything ended wonderfully for her and her and her new husband at this point, and be done with my story. But that's that's not how it happens. On April 13th, 1992, her daughter Amber was found in a lifeless state. Tina had been visiting Jean Lagelle, a friend and therapist, when Heron called to say he could not wake Amber up. They took her to the hospital where she passed away. In the week prior to this happening, Tina had discovered bruises on the child's body, but Heron told her that Amber had fallen. Tina says that she feared that if she had taken Amber to the hospital, that they would have taken her away from her. Upon examination, it was discovered that Amber had suffered physical injuries, some of which were pretty old. There were also internal injuries that indicated she had been sodomized. Wow. She really knows how to pick them. And it's not her fault, but like how it's so amazing to me that one person could constantly like keep finding herself in a terrible situation like that. I mean, it's just, so... you're right. I mean, and then she's had such a fucked up upbringing. She really doesn't know what normal's like. Right. So it's it's hard for her to see, like, I got to find a good guy because she doesn't have a good example. She's never had a good example. Never. Uh, all except for Dr. Roll. I think that her time with him, when he took her to study her, basically, that's why she um, she felt kind of a bond with him. She felt like this was a good guy. He had a good wife. They were kind to her. So yeah. when things started going bad, that's why she called him and he brought her in. You know, he and he, yeah. he really took a liking to her. He was really just. Uh, he's a good person. I mean, he's just trying to help someone that really needs it. Yeah. But it's really easy for people that have been brought up in a bad situation and all they're doing is being surrounded by bad situations to think this one good person. Well, that's not the norm. And he's just special. Right. And so they still associate with negative people. It's I mean, what you're raised around and brought up yeah. with it really affects you for a lot of your life. You could yeah. want better, but 
is you can kind of disassociate yourself from that and be like, that's a good person, but that's for other people. This is my normal shitty ass people. Her, yeah. not me, obviously. <laughs> I mean, I just, I often wonder, often because I've been reading the story all week, you know, it, it said that her, uh, whatever was going on around her had kind of, you know, disappeared at some point. But I wonder if she ended up finding these situations to happen to her over and over again, because these people felt like she was causing other shit to still happen around them. And they were trying to take this abuse out on her to make it stop. I don't know. It's just so weird that she did keep ending up in like almost the same situation over and over again. Yeah. So I don't have a I don't have any explanation for it. We don't. You don't know because you're never in those people's shoes. You can't explain like yeah. that kind of mentality or what was going on with them. Yeah. No. So Tina and Heron were arrested on April 15th for Amber's murder. While Tina's story did not waver, Heron's was erratic. He said that he never hit Amber but saw Tina slap her and said that Tina must have hit the child too hard. And as a result, she died later that day. He finally admitted to having sodomized the child twice and that he hit her during his final interview with the police. The murder charge meant a possible death penalty for Tina. She was held in jail for two years before the trial. Her public defender did not make the effort to get her testimony or to find evidence to support her innocence. The second time her public defender contacted her about two weeks before the trial was to inform her that if she pled guilty, the judge would waive the death penalty. Tina decided to plead guilty under the circumstances. October 24th, 1994, she was given life plus 20 years with no chance of parole. Heron, the child molester, was charged with cruelty to children and was sentenced to 20 years with possibility of early parole. I'm almost like, did I miss fucking something? But I know I didn't. I'm intensely listening to you. Yeah. It's like, what what just happened here? Right. He right. accused her of something. Now she's the murderer. Oh, but yeah, I did hit her and I did sodomize her. Twice. 20 years. Right. What just happened here? It's It's angering to say the least. And I don't know if he had a better attorney. For him to get out with a a slap on the hand, you know, for something like this. And she's in there forever. She's locked away. (sighs) Tina's story, including the now famous photograph, was allegedly featured on a 1993 episode of Unsolved Mysteries. My jam. Yeah. (laughs) Never saw this story, though. No, no, that's right. This should have been season five. But after watching a lot of Unsolved Mysteries this week, and specifically the episode that refers to this case, I have to assume that it was cut out or the internet is incorrect, which, (laughs) no. (laughs) The internet is never wrong. What are you talking about? What? (laughs) So I was pissed off because, like... I, I'm watching all these episodes, which it doesn't bother me, to say the least. I love the Unsolved Mysteries, especially the ones with Robert Stack. But I couldn't understand yes. why it says in sequential order all of these episodes. Here's the one I'm looking for. I found that episode. That part is not in that episode. Why? So I brought that up to my husband. Actually, I was annoyed. So I tell him about all the things I'm annoyed with. <laughs> <laughs> and this one so, just so happened to be at like six o'clock in the morning. <laughs> I'm sure that went over well. It's so funny because <laughs> I'm sure he's like, crazy bitch is at it again. Um, so the thing is, when I told that to him, he was like, actually, that makes sense. <laughs> because he remembers watching the show when he was a kid and it seemed like the show would jump from like it would jump into another story that didn't really fit in. So like he felt like they were kind of cutting to save on time and then trying to slice and dice, you know, these episodes just to squeeze in more stories. And I'm like, I don't remember that. And before you guys go jump into your uh, conclusions, Matt, because that's exactly what I did. 
I had to stop and realize that I was about to argue with my man uh, who happens to have a dolphin-like memory, especially when it comes <laughs> to useless facts. I mean, I just have to tell you this. You should know that this guy watched a shit ton of TV as a kid and can recall specific episodes of things like The Golden Girls or Valerie <laughs> slash Valerie's family slash The Hogan family, whatever the fuck it ended up being called, and Alf. So... <laughs> I Elf was the best. Right? And exactly. also, just real quick, I saw a sun visor for like the front of your car. You know how they have the Star Wars one and they're in the yes. front of the Millennium Falcon and stuff? I saw a yeah. Golden Girls one in the parking lot of my work. Oh, cool. And I thought, that's cool as shit. That is cool as shit. <laughs> but yeah, wow. Alf was a fantastic show too. Yeah, isn't that funny? Like, I don't even remember that he had to eat, like his thing was eating cats. So yes. do you remember that? <laughs> Because yes. I was like, man, that's fucked up. <laughs> that shit would not make it on TV anymore. No. People would shut that shit down. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> so recalling some of these things and, and conversations that I've had with him, I, I have to say that maybe he is right. And I was wrong for thinking that he remembered incorrectly. Needless to say, I have yet to find the episode exactly where that story is on Unsolved Mysteries. And if you happen to know where I can find it, please write to us at Creatures of the Night, Paranormal at gmail.com. And just like Unsolved Mysteries, I'd love to have an update where we find our <laughs> long lost Unsolved Mysteries episodes. You know, like how they did the, uh, the long lost relatives update or like they found their long lost love or something. Yeah, just any of the update things yeah. were so fucking good. I know. Those were always my favorites. Like, yes, what are they going to tell me about? I don't know. Maybe there's an update to the the whole punctured guy uh, that they found after that plane crash that you could never find of your episode. Right? You know? <laughs> Why can't I find that episode? If somebody could please, nobody knows what we're talking about. But it was, was it the vampire episode? Yeah, it was in the vampire episode that you were talking about. So that was a Stephen King told me something. It was okay or okay. whatever. Yeah, Stephen King yeah. it was okay. I swear there's an episode from Unsolved Mysteries where they're talking about the Bermuda Triangle, yet they like toss in there was a vampire that bit a pilot on the neck. Yeah. And yeah, I don't know. Somebody help me out with that. Cause his plane went down and they found him. I guess his blood had been drained or something. And he had those two puncture marks on his yeah, neck. He yeah. He had the two puncture marks on his neck. And like, I never. I mean, the rest of my life, I've slept with my hair covering my neck just to be on safe side. That's so I mean, side. like, you got to tell me I'm not crazy and that actually existed. I'm sure that story is out there, but finding it is is going to be difficult because, like I said, <laughs> of all the stories that I watched this week, and it was like, it's definitely there. I see it. It's on season five. I, I saw all the other ones that they talked about, but this one was missing. So um, apparently unsolved. <laughs> unsolved mysteries are also a mystery. <laughs> <laughs> I almost thought you were going to say that your husband told you, I bet they took that shit out. What? Well, maybe I thought he was going to say that because I was going to say that. And <laughs> maybe they cut it like for the replay because it's a brutal ass fucking story. And is. they don't want people looking at to how dark and unjust it is. Well, true. And uh, going right back into that. Uh, it's possible that they shot the Unsolved Mysteries prior to the situation with her daughter and they cut it out now that they know that she's also she was in jail because they don't I'm sure they don't want to come off looking like one sided or anything because it was a popular TV show. This whole situation with her daughter happened in 92. I don't remember season five. Oh, season five was in 93. So actually it did take place after. So I don't know. I have no idea. But maybe they just cut it out. I don't know. I don't know, but that's some dark ass shit, you yeah. know, for them to be talking about. And then just like, I mean, what are you going to do? Do you have an update? Like she's still in prison or she was still in prison? Did she, she die in prison? She's still in prison. As a matter of fact, of the videos that I watched, I saw a lot of people trying desperately to do anything that they can to cause awareness to the situation and how unjust and how unfair it is for her to be in there. And I wasn't going to turn this into a crusade. Um, that's not like what our podcast no, is about. Well, we also don't know the full story. Exactly. I mean, we get this by some some internet articles here and there. We're not like, you know, researching the entire thing, looking at all the evidence. How do we know that the all from all the abuse that she suffered, mm -hmm. that she also started to abuse? Right. We don't you know, know. 
that would seem plausible too that maybe she maybe she was abusive to her kid we don't know and i'm not saying that i'm just saying right like how i said before when you're raised a certain way and you don't know any better it would it would make sense i don't believe that that's really what happened yeah but maybe maybe there is some evidence against her and we don't know that because right. it's not like we went that far into the story no so this isn't like go boycott the prison and get her out don't listen to our show for really hardcore facts, okay? <laughs> no, <laughs> no, because I, I did as much research as I could on the internet, but I don't know the, the, anything outside of what the internet is spewing. And of course, that's that's going to be one-sided, geared to whoever's actually writing that. So, yeah. Yeah, it, and we were in it for one thing. You were in it for the paranormal elements of it. Right. How is it possible that these this poltergeist activity is happening? You know, we're not um, sleuthing no. To, to solve them. You've been working on this for a week, not years. Don't right. trust <laughs> Don't trust necessarily <laughs> what we're saying. It just does seem like she got dealt a really bad, bad hand. I'm, I mean, but uh, honestly, I mean, her daughter obviously got the worst end of this. She really did. Um, yeah. yeah. So, yeah. So that's a fucked up story. It is a fucked up story. Like I said, I, I know we tend to like to give the history at the beginning, but the history of, of Tina was fucked up to, to, to begin with. And now basically both of my stories, because there was Anne-Marie Schabert in there too, they have something in common. Both unnatural occurrences seem to circle around women that had some sort of emotional turbulences. Also, both of their occurrences seem to dissipate with time, or at least that's what the stories that I've read lead you to believe, which is yeah. in both cases – even in the Lorancy uh, case that uh, Wendy had mentioned earlier, the Watsika case, it was also said that uh, she lost her abilities when she got married. It also said her abilities came when she got sick that and went into like a coma or whatever. And I've read that about other psychics or mediums or whatever. Their powers tend to come on after some traumatic event. Right. So, guys, be warned because we're I'm talking just about women here. <laughs> <laughs> no, but what's crazy is this whole thing really reminded me of an X-Files episode too. Of course, I'm going back to the Unsolved Mysteries and the X-Files and classics. Uh, all the classics. The <laughs> so, and what was weird is I I had to look back at that episode just to see like why it was reminding me of it. So the the episode uh, was se- season 3. And it was called something I'm going to not be able to pronounce, I'm sure. It's Sizigi, I think. <laughs> <laughs> but it was these women that were able to manipulate the atmosphere based on their emotional, you know, situations at the time. This girl wanted that dude and she got pissy, so she did some crazy shit. I mean, it, it was it was kind of funny how it was along the same lines, even though I know that the X-Files was a it's a fictional story so it was just made for entertainment but having said all of that that episode was based in New Hampshire <laughs> <laughs> I was like damn I love the X-Files so the question is do women have some sort of buried ability my immediate follow up to that is I fucking hope so <laughs> but really, I think that both women from my stories must have had a deeper connection that I unfortunately do not know any more about. It's just pretty amazing, I think, and I hate it that in both cases, these women were thought to be a nuisance, you know? In Anne Marie's case, she was let go in order to rid the office of the paranormal issues. And in Tina's case, shit, I mean, her life was just. <sighs> oh, they were trying to beat that shit out of her. Exactly. Like. That was fucked up. We talked about that forever ago, and I couldn't tell you what episode that was. But I had listened to a lore episode, and there were these kids that they almost seemed like they had inherited the ability to be mediums. And weird thing was happening at school and stuff like that. And I can't remember all of it. I know that the dad because they inherited the traits from their mom. So she was down for it. She's like, yeah, that's been happening to me yes. forever. Yeah. But the dad was like, y'all better cut that shit out. Yeah, I remember you that. Know? So, that was like, Vermont. Some people... That was the little house in Vermont, yeah. right? Yeah. Yeah, but I can't remember the name of the family or anything. And yeah, he was like, you know, he's trying to keep it under wraps and keep it under control. Yeah. And these kids are fucking bonkers. You know, it was during the whole time of um, spiritualist. So they were, off, they were able to go off and make money on it. 
Yes. This poor little girl had something going on, both of them, and they were just, they were ridiculed for it. Yeah. And then like shunned. And it, who knows that their powers actually ever stopped. They might've just been able to, as they matured, they were able to control it. Yeah. And they put a stop to that shit because they were like, yeah, this is not doing me any good. You know, I, nobody finds this attractive. I think that that would be pretty darn cool. You know, if by the time you, you get a little older, you just kind of learn how to turn that shit off and on as as you wanted to to deal with it. Because seriously, if I had that ability, I would be sitting on my couch drinking wine while I've got the vacuum cleaner <laughs> running and the dishes are going, dinner's getting cooked. I mean, and like if someone were to come home, I'd jump up, everything turns off except for dinner. And I'm just standing there doing my own thing. You know, that would be the best, I think. I think, yeah. So I'm a strong believer in that everybody has a little bit of some kind of what you would consider psychic ability or something like that. Yeah. They ha they can do more with their mind than we all realize. Mm -hmm. And so when we're younger, we're more susceptible to seeing things or feeling things or whatever, being connected with this kind of, you know, wonky energy around us. <laughs> yeah. And as we get older and more distracted by things and lazy and tired... You know, we kind yeah. of start paying less attention to it unless we make an effort to do so, as True. we kind of do. And as, you know, many psychic mediums and, you know, people that are hippies I don't <laughs> know, <laughs> that are way into that stuff, I appreciate all of it and support it. Yeah. But for day to day people that are not so into it, you know, they get distracted. They don't have those experiences anymore. This power is a little different than just being kind of hypersensitive to things. But what you were questioning, do all women have the, this ability buried inside of them? I think maybe all people might. It's just how much you pay attention to it. And then some more yeah. than others, of course, because it seemed yeah. like in these women's cases, they had a hard time controlling it. So I don't think that they were like working on it themselves. Yeah. They were just like, oh, that's crazy. I was just thinking I wanted to hit somebody <laughs> with that stapler and yeah, there it, it happened. happened. That's strange. <laughs> that's crazy. <laughs> <laughs> yeah it's crazy it's true that's a good point because uh, back to the story that you had just referenced and i don't remember their names either but it was a, a family it was brothers and sisters that had those powers so i guess it's just and some people it's stronger in them than others or, or maybe it mm -hmm. takes them a while to actually control that shit and and then and then these ladies cases uh it only subsided once they kind of found happiness and they weren't just so angry or i don't know I say that, but I, I think one of one lady is still not very happy. No, and you wonder things happen in prison or whatever, and nobody's reporting that. Yeah, she probably gets stuck in like solitary confinement like all the time. Yeah, if they still do that. I don't know. The woman's prison. I don't even know where she's uh, in jail at. Honestly, I, I probably have it because this is the story that I told you. I had like fourteen pages of. I just I, there was just. <laughs> so and much we got to cut it off somewhere I mean, I can't. Well, it's also just it's really depressing to yeah. think that wow that didn't work out for her at all yeah you know we're like what a cute story she knows how to move things with her mind look yeah. at her moving this telephone and yeah then it's like oh she was super abused had a rough life and then we don't know what happened really in adulthood so I, but, I i had almost considered not even going into that part of her life but her story needed to be told. Oh yeah. And like I said, I, I'm not I'm not a, a bedside sleuth here, even though I, I would love to be one. I I don't know the full story uh, and and how it all played out for her. I just know what's out there on the internet. So take it for what it is, and it's just a story of the paranormal. And I gave you some insights to her life as it developed. Not that I'm like I said, campaigning for anything either way for her, but No, but it was good for you to give two examples. Yes. This chick had some shit going on at work. People didn't like it. <laughs> she moved on, got married, settled the fuck down. Mm -hmm. And then you can also see how it could go very badly. Yeah, it went very, very badly. Some very carry, fire starter type life. <laughs> yeah. yeah, yeah, right. So I will be uh, eventually sharing some of these pictures, including the picture that I sent to Wendy, which is of the flying telephone that flew across Tina's lap. We'll be putting that on social media. That's right, guys. We have that just in case you were like, hmm, where can I find these pictures? Well, you don't even have to do any work because I've already got it ready to go. 
it'll be on social media. <laughs> Just visit us on Instagram. It's C-O-T-N underscore paranormal and on Facebook and Twitter. And that is just plain old C-O-T-N paranormal, right? Yes. Okay. <laughs> I'm like, oh my God, I got them backwards. Please comment as much as you want and share your own stories. If you have them or anything that really uh, relates, that would be super cool. If any of you are experiencing any kind of strange paranormal activity, telekinesis, uh, things flying around in your house, uh, we'd love to hear about that. So drop us a line. That's creatures of the night paranormal at gmail.com. Yeah. If you've ever seen everything, anything like move on its own and you've been like, did I do that? Yeah. I mean, <laughs> share that with us. We'd love to talk that out with you. So. <laughs> So uh, there it is. That was my paranormal episode for you this evening. And I hope it wasn't super depressing for you. Uh, <laughs> it's pretty but, rough, but <laughs> yeah, it was a rough one. It was definitely a rough one. But thanks so much for listening, guys. Thanks. Bye. Bye.